Thank you very much. I'm not used to being accompanied by music as I walk around. But <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful to see. Good evening. My gosh, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to each and every one of you. I'm delighted to have this occasion yet again to gather together with you as members of what I believe is probably the most exciting dynamic archdiocese in this, in this country. So I want to express, yes, you are, you are. So I want to express to you right away before anything else my personal thanks to each and every one of you. Thank you for the countless ways that you're announcing the gospel and serving the mission of the church in our multiple parish ministries, in Catholic education, health care, social services, and you know also in the many quiet, unseen ways that you serve daily in your families, in volunteer outreach, or by seeking each day to grow in your personal relationship of knowledge and love with Jesus Christ, who of course is the reason and the inspiration for all that we do. The massive footprint, the very large and positive mark the Catholic Church makes in the province of Alberta is extraordinary. Thanks to you, the many other disciples who comprise the Archdiocese of Edmonton. Thank you. Now, while the desire to express our gratitude to God and to one another animates every annual gathering, every Archbishop's dinner, each dinner also has its own particular theme. Well, we're all well aware by now um, that this year has a particular spotlight. The new pastoral priorities that will unfold in the Archdiocese over the next three years. And that's what I'd like to reflect upon with you for the next few minutes. Let me tee this up though first by providing the context for these priorities and then calling to mind the immediate background. In other words, why are we doing this and how did we get here to this point? By context, what I mean simply is the present moment. The current reality that we need to name if we are effectively to announce the message of mercy hope and peace that we call the gospel. Now, strange as this may seem, the present moment confronted me not long ago in a rather dramatic and very surprising manner on an airplane. I was taking a flight from Toronto to Edmonton and during the boarding process I took my aisle seat about halfway down the plane I think it was and shortly after I was seated a woman got on the plane, walked down the aisle and indicated to me that hers was the window seat in the same row. So I got up to let her in. When she noticed that I was dressed in clerics, she did this. Ugh. That's what she did. Ugh. Now, I'm accustomed to getting that reaction from Father Kavanaugh every time I walk into his office but I didn't expect to get it from a stranger on a plane. And when she saw my rather startled expression, she said, look, look, I'm sorry. I've had a very bad day. And I arrived at the airport frustrated and really short-tempered. I was not very nice at all to the agent at the gate. Now that I see you, I know I'm going to hell for sure. You can't make this stuff up, it happens. <laughs> now, if we tease out what she said there, I think we've got a pretty good summary of our present moment. A bad day, lack of kindness to others, the carrying of guilt and fear for the future. Many of our contemporaries are dealing with more, far more than a single bad day, often with little to no sense of how to get ahead of the difficulties. The loss of civility among peoples is widespread and growing. Infliction on others of great suffering is happening both globally and locally. And this creates inescapably a heavy burden of guilt, which draws people ever more darkly in upon themselves and away from healed and healthy relationships. And worry about the future, well, that's more likely to extend not to the next world, but next week. 
as individuals and families wonder if the sickness will be cured or the paycheck will stretch to the end of the month. In short, our present moment is one in which the people of our day need a message, a reliable and a trustworthy message of assurance, mercy, peace, and hope. And the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has also been watching all this and has spoken untiringly of the need to announce the joy of the gospel. And this is why he has called the whole church from the outset of his pontificate to a profound missionary renewal. Mission's not new, of course. We all know that baptism sends us out into the world as missionary disciples of Jesus Christ. What the Pope is asking of us, and this brings me now to how we arrived at our priorities, what he's asking is that we sit down with one another so as to read clearly the signs of the times, what is going on, so as we can, so we can discern together how the Lord Jesus is calling us now to new missionary endeavors in his name for the sake of his people. Obviously, I'm referring to the synodal process to which Pope Francis summoned the universal church and which has been unfolding over the last few years. When we accepted this challenge here in the archdiocese, we held in the course of nearly one year about 350 listening sessions, which generated over 4,000 responses. A rich variety of ideas, concerns, and hopes were voiced in all that. From among them all, one entreaty was made most frequently, and it was the appeal for more formation in the faith, precisely in order to be well-equipped for participation in the church's mission. So how shall we in the Archdiocese respond to this plea from yourselves and many others among the people of God? Formation is not something new. It's happening all the time. And for example, Bible studies or explorations of the catechism of the church in our parishes, post-secondary institutions, associations of the lay faithful, and so on. And in addition to all of this, though, can we create a framework for an archdiocesan effort and designate within it a set of priorities that will give common direction to us all and unite our various initiatives? Well, in answer to that need, I've written you a letter. More precisely, I've updated a letter that many will remember I wrote to the people of the Archdiocese in 2017. And Tim mentioned earlier, you have a copy of this letter at your places. Entitled, Living in the Word of God, it develops briefly and simply the two fundamental conditions for following Jesus Christ, listening to the Word of God and putting it into practice. Hear God and obey. Listen to Jesus and respond to him in his teaching. That's the Christian life in its essence. Of course, we need to spell that out somewhat. So the letter also recalls that the church's response to the teachings of Christ has always been threefold, through worship, witness, and service. Here we have the framework for our archdiocesan formation efforts. For the next three years, our parishes will follow locally developed programs to help parishioners grow in the knowledge of our beautiful Catholic faith. Uniting all our efforts will be the common commitment to formation with respect to the three pillars of our Catholic life, worship, witness, and service, in accord with a specific focus that I'm designating for each of them. And for the remainder of this presentation, I'll develop that now with you. With respect to worship, I've asked that our formation give particular attention to the mystery of the Eucharist. This is the heart of our Catholic life. It's our very breath. In this period of formation, we can and we should ask ourselves some practical questions about how we're doing in the actual celebration of the Mass in our parishes and what might be done to celebrate them even more worthily and well for example, do we understand the meanings of the rituals and the gestures that form the liturgical action? Or are we familiar with the history behind the majestic prayers and beautiful acclamations the church has used in the Mass for centuries? Does the sacred music we offer truly raise the heart and mind to God? And how do we prepare ahead of time for Mass? In particular, though, 
I pray that we all ponder carefully and reflect prayerfully upon the mystery of the real presence, the wondrous truth that the simple gifts of bread and wine are fully transformed into the true body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. In our churches, there's a crucifix near the altar as mass is celebrated. A grade five catechism teacher once asked her class if they could describe the difference between Jesus on the cross and Jesus on the altar. After a few minutes, one of the children said, well, on the cross, I can see him, but I know he's not there. On the altar, I know he's there, but I can't see him. This is the mystery of faith. The Lord Jesus truly present in our midst. A while back, I was on a small shuttle bus and seated across from me was a young couple with their infant child, a girl about one year old. Now the little one was upset, crying, fidgety, fussing. And I was quite taken with the way the parents calmed the child. The mother lifted the baby up on her lap while the father positioned himself so that the infant could see him. The child settled down right away and tears were quickly replaced by a smile. Once the little girl could feel the embrace and see those who would take care of her, the anxiety vanished. That's precisely the promise of the Eucharist. In this wondrous sacrament, Jesus, who loves us even to the point of giving his life, renders himself present in the transformed gifts of bread and wine. The embrace of love, signified by his outstretched arms on the cross, reaches and enfolds us each time we celebrate the Mass, reminiscent of the mother holding and calming her child. And what's more, like the father on the bus, Jesus in the Eucharist positions himself, as it were, so that we can see him and thus have the assurance that he's with us. My prayer is that our formation around the Eucharist will help us to embrace ever more deeply and be embraced ever more securely by this wondrous truth that encounters us every time we celebrate the Mass. How about witness now? Well, we cannot keep the faith to ourselves. Touched by the love of Christ, we're naturally moved to share that good news with others. That's what we mean by witness. And formation for witness over the next three years will have as its aim the development of confidence. We need to be confident in our grasp of the truths of our faith and convinced of the beauty and hope our faith offers the world. And on this need for confident witness, tonight I'd like to make simply two fundamental points. First, the developing of confidence will mean taking time to identify and articulate the often challenging questions of the day, those of our contemporaries as well as our own, and understand well the response that arises from the word of God and tradition of the church. Very often I've heard comments like, well, Archbishop, we know we're supposed to give witness to our faith in Jesus, but we don't feel equipped to do so. We don't know the answers faith gives to today's difficult questions, or we often feel our own awareness of the faith is too weak for us to defend it. So I ask that in each parish, you identify those questions that are foremost in your minds, bring them forward to your pastor or to the parish formation leaders he's designated for these priorities, and then discuss together how you can address them and discover the beauty and rightness of the answers that our faith proposes. These questions and the manner by which they are approached will likely differ from parish to parish. It's natural, it's okay. One particular issue though remains of immediate common concern and I ask that we continue to address it together. I'm speaking here of the spread of euthanasia across our country at what is a truly alarming rate. It shouldn't be happening at all, of course, but it is. And with this comes a number of questions troubling our people. So tonight I'd like to remind us all of the Archdiocesan Initiative entitled Hope and Dignity, which clearly and thoroughly outlines the Catholic response to euthanasia and assisted suicide. 
If your parish has not already done so, please make this a cornerstone of your formation efforts aimed at developing confident witnesses. My second fundamental point here is this. Let's keep always in mind that Christian confidence is not simply a matter of having sufficient intellectual knowledge. It arises from something much deeper than that. I was reminded of this by a piece of art produced by a young student from our Francophone Catholic school district, Le Conseil Centre Nord. Now the context for its creation, I think Tim was mentioning this earlier, the context was a school art project. Students from our 10 school divisions were invited to share their God-given talents in order to give witness through art. Back in May, during Catholic Education Week, over 150 students, parents, and educators gathered at the Archdiocesan Pastoral Center to showcase their masterpieces. The works are now on loan to the Archdiocese, and they currently adorn the walls of our assembly hall. Every piece is beautiful, especially so to me for whom the drawing of a stick man is a significant accomplishment. But one painting in particular caught my attention that day. The painting depicts the cross of Christ radiating light like an explosion. And already we have a profound truth expressed here. In the very person of Jesus Christ, especially through his death and resurrection, the love of God, victorious over sin and death and source of life and hope, has burst into human history. I learned that the young artist, who could not be present that day, is with autism spectrum and nonverbal. He's in grade one. And what this tells me is that the child's knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ has developed within a silent interiority. What that says to us all is that confidence for witness is much more than knowledge of the catechism. It must spring from deep within the silence of our hearts, from our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So my prayer is that the next three years will form a privileged moment for each of us to grow both in the knowledge and love of Jesus and in zeal to proclaim him publicly as the Christ, the light of the world. The name of the young artist is Enzo, and he and his parents are here with us tonight. So I'd ask that they stand and be recognized. There we go. Très bien fait, Enzo. On est fier. Félicitations. And now our third pastoral priority, formation for service. Now we know that there are many avenues for the expression of Christian charity. This archdiocese has in fact a noble history of service in the name of Christ. And a recent and telling example is your response to the needs of the people of Jasper. We established an archdiocesan fund to assist the nearly 90 families of Our Lady of Lourdes Parish there, who because of the massive fire, lost everything. Thank you for all your generous support of this effort. And tonight, allow me to single out our brothers and sisters in Hinton, whose parish is represented among us. You in Hinton have gone above and beyond to welcome and assist the people in need who have reached out to you. So, on behalf of us all, I express to Fathers Nerasetti and Udumala, to Deacon Ed Medding and his wife Gwen, to Mary Lou LaFrance, and all the parishioners, our heartfelt thanks and our pledge of ongoing support. I believe some members of the Hinton Parish are here. Would you stand and be recognized? Well done. Now, from, the many, from among the many avenues along which formation for service could be pursued in our parishes, I've asked that we give particular attention to the care of marriage and of family. These are under great strain, and our faith equips us well to give the needed accompaniment. We can all name 
many negative consequences today of family decline. What I see as the most devastating impact in our time is the loss of a sense of real identity and a sense of belonging. This is leaving many people, especially the young, feeling alone, isolated, and floundering. We see among both the young and adults a retreat into themselves, evidenced by the omnipresent earbuds and headphones. Society is not only fracturing, it's also increasingly atomized. What's going on? Well, family is linked inseparably with identity and belonging. And we all know this from our own personal experience. In my case, I found that very tellingly illustrated over the years as I watched my nieces and nephews grow up. In gatherings at the home of my parents, they would always be distracted by toys, smartphones, or video games until, until their grandparents began to recount family stories. And at that point, the kids would willingly and even eagerly put all those things aside in order to listen. And as they listened to episodes of past family adventures or tales about growing up, difficult moments, happy moments, funny moments, and all the rest, the kids were absolutely riveted. They still are, in fact, even now as young adults, when stories continue to be shared with them. They miss nothing of what is said, drinking it all in, and then light up when we begin to tell stories about them growing up. The joy that they feel, it seems to me, is twofold. The joy of belonging, of being a part of something bigger than themselves, part of a network of relationships. And at the same time, the joy of being noticed, of having a part of mattering. They're not just a member of the group. They are, within their family, a someone whose very existence is celebrated and who matters just because they exist. So it's easy to see how devastating a tear in these foundational and determinative relationships would be. I call such rupture an original wound, a break within the nexus of relationships that gives and sustains life from its origins. This leaves one suffering from such a hurt with a weakened or lost sense of identity, unsure where they fit. Now, these wounds are the deepest and most painful and are being felt more often than we care to admit. No need to wonder then about the source of widespread isolation and loneliness and the harm it engenders not least in youth homelessness or the growing pervasiveness of addiction to increasingly lethal drugs. Given this reality, what focus shall we give to our formation for service? Well, it seems to me that we have to get back to basics, to rediscover and reappropriate the truth and beauty of Christian marriage. The lifelong marital bond between husband and wife is, after all, the wellspring and mainstay of the family. So let's examine carefully and gratefully what Jesus himself teaches about marriage. Let's explore whether marital bond is a sacrament and how we invite its grace to flow into the home to enliven, heal, and strengthen family life. In light of the church's rich tradition regarding the sacrament of matrimony, we shall also review our marriage formation programs and ask how we can better accompany the newly married. I pray that we all be formed deeply in the church's rich teaching on marriage and family in order to serve well this vital cell of our church and of our world. To conclude, we undertake these priorities now, calling upon the inspiration of the Holy Spirit our ever-present companion and guide. The Spirit reveals Jesus to us, unites us ever more deeply to him, and empowers us for mission in his name. Only by the Holy Spirit can we penetrate the mysteries of our faith. And let's rely, too, upon the help of the Blessed Mother, whose image features prominently in our room this evening. 
It depicts the Virgin Mary under her title, Our Lady of Guadalupe. This is an exact digital laser replica of the famous Marian image, reproduced directly from St. Juan Diego's Tilma, where it miraculously appeared in 1531 and is preserved to this day at Our Lady of Guadalupe Basilica in Mexico City. And this reproduction was entrusted to Christine Fuzzy Erickson of St. Thomas More Parish in 2001 by the rector of that basilica as a gift to the Canadian people and has traveled across Canada since that time. As of last spring, the home for the image is now this archdiocese. So we've designated Our Lady under this particular title, Our Lady of Guadalupe, as the patroness of our pastoral priorities. She is, after all, the perfect exemplar of putting the word of God into practice. She who said, be it done unto me according to thy word. She who told the servants at Cana, do whatever he tells you. Now will help us by her prayers, protection, and guidance to give our own fiat to God, to say with her, be it done, to the call from our Lord to do his word through joyful worship, confident witness, and loving service. Well, I can, I'd like to thank Christine and her husband, Ted, who have cared for this image of Our Lady since 2001, as well as Lucy Tenemente, who has been involved in its transfer to different locations across Canada. I understand all three are present with us, so I'd ask that they stand and be recognized for your great dedication. The mission to proclaim Jesus Christ is the most challenging and the most exciting venture there is, and we have to be well prepared for it. Thank you for all that you're doing in service of the church's mission, and thank you for embracing these new pastoral priorities. Knowing that our Blessed Mother is with us and praying for us, I'm excited by the many graces that will surely flow throughout the Archdiocese as we delve together into the wondrous treasures of our beautiful, extraordinarily beautiful Catholic faith. Thank you. God bless you all.